I'm very glad to be here, uh, and I'm also very jealous that I have to be online. I would have much preferred to join you in person. I, uh, I've been at Pookie uh, several times, uh, and it's uh, it's a wonderful university, and uh, it's always very interesting to talk about uh, uh, global matters. I remember about 20 years ago, the first time I came, uh, we were talking about the globalization, and now we're going to talk about the decarbonization. And uh, uh, so I uh, hope uh, you will uh, uh, enjoy my um, uh, talk. So uh, my uh, title is a little bit strange, and in English it sounds exactly like it does in uh, uh, Portuguese. So on purpose, uh, I will try to convince you that we can use carbon to decarbonize. And if we do this properly, we will also get hydrogen for free. So um, I'm not the first talk today. Maybe somebody has already shown this plot. But uh, these days, uh, many speakers will start uh, their talks uh, saying that uh, the carbon dioxide uh, levels in the atmosphere were in a relatively narrow band until the Industrial Revolution. And then as the Industrial Revolution uh, starts, our carbon dioxide levels jump by, uh, you know, almost double. And uh, the next thing that uh, the speaker will say is we must uh, uh, decarbonize. And uh, um, can we really do that? Is that the right way to think about it? Well, we are carbon life may as life forms. So in dry mass, half of our body is carbon, half of our food is carbon, and half of our clothes is carbon. And if you don't believe me, you can even buy t-shirts that say this. So the problem is not carbon. The problem is carbon dioxide. And we have a language challenge. And obviously, the language challenge is in Brazil and in Portuguese too, because we use the same word for carbon and carbon dioxide. And so we say that's carbon is a cell, whereas we should use a different word. And I've been starting to use decox. Um, because in English, this sounds a lot like detox, which is the detoxification that you have to do when you're addicted to something. And our addiction is not so much to carbon. Our addiction is to burning carbon. So uh, what we're looking at is that the man-made perturbation to a global carbon cycle. So uh, the carbon emissions that come from our burning of oil, gas, and coal uh, are actually a relatively small uh, fraction of uh, total uh, emissions. Uh, we've imbalanced the natural carbon cycle by about 5%. Uh, so the uh, natural emissions are about 20 times bigger. Now, the problem is the natural emissions are balanced. So there are uh, sinks that balance the natural emissions. But we don't have a balance for our uh, man-made emissions. But what you see in this graph that comes out of Stanford's uh, um, carbon budget uh, project is that uh, the uh, land sink and the ocean sink are growing, are working a little bit higher than baseline. This is not the total land and ocean sink. This is the additional CO2 that's been uh, sequestered or converted into carbon uh, um, by vegetation and by oceanic processes. So the first message is if we reduce and stop the burning of fossil fuels, the atmospheric concentration of CO2 will go uh, down again. The second part of this slide has to do with how we apportion emissions. So we say that a lot of emissions come from making electricity and making heat, but these are not end users. If we look at how we use electricity and heat, what we see is actually the biggest emitter is industry. And in fact, you can see this in this bottom graph where we show the CO2 emissions separated by countries and block of countries. So what you see is that uh, the CO2 emissions of the United States and Europe uh, have been declining for over 20 years, whereas the CO2 emissions of China um, took off uh, starting in the 1980, uh, surpassed uh, Europe uh, and the United States in the early 2000s, and by now they are uh, more than the United States and Europe combined. 
This is not because the United States and Europe have become particularly good at reducing CO2 emissions. It is because manufacturing moved away from the United States and Europe and into China. That is the biggest driver for this trend. So, two messages. One is nature can help us. If we reduce emissions, nature will be reducing the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. Uh, and uh, making stuff causes CO2 emissions. Now, one approach, which probably will be discussed uh, today or has already been discussed uh, in uh, uh, this conference, is uh, what's called uh, CCS, Carbon Capture and Storage, which really means carbon dioxide capture and storage. And it's also called carbon management. This allows continued burning of fossil fuels, and it treats the CO2 as a waste management problem. So it's a, uh, essentially, however, when we look at waste management, uh, the truck that manages our waste, which would be the plants that capture the CO2, is only part of it. The intrinsic problem is that uh, uh, one has to pay somebody to remove the waste, and one has to pay somebody to take the waste. So no matter how good the track is, these two problems remain, right? And so um, the, there is a limited potential for uh, CCS because it's not a technology that adds value, it's a technology that man manages waste. To tell you how big is this uh, problem, in comparison, if you look at the waste from all uh, cities, it's about uh, 2 billion tons a year. A gigaton is billion tons. Uh, the total CO2 emissions are 37 gigatons a year. And uh, so it's about 20 times bigger, um, which still tells you it's daunting because uh, we can't even manage all the urban waste, and now we want to manage something that's much, much bigger than this. Also, economically, this will be a massive feat. At $100 a ton for CCS, which is uh, what uh, uh, it's being pushed in the U.S. right now, this becomes a $3.7 trillion a year business, um, but it's not a business that is generating value. It's a business made managing waste. Now, this is 60% of the global oil and gas industry. The global oil and gas industry is about $6 trillion a year, and it's 5% of the world GDP. The world GDP is about $80 trillion a year. Um, and so, no, it's not a surprise that people like uh, oil and gas companies are pushing for this because they want to be paid twice, one for the oil and gas and one for capturing the CO2. Now, nobody puts it in context, okay? And you, the way I put it in context is let's look at a simple case where we're burning natural gas to generate electricity. And so for each ton of natural gas that we burn, uh, in uh, Texas, uh, where we have plenty of natural gas, this is about $150 to pay for a ton of natural gas. Uh, a ton of natural gas generates 2.75 tons of carbon dioxide. And so if we want to capture it all, this would be $275 of cost coming from uh, uh, CCS. So our cost of storage, uh, capture and storage, would be almost twice our cost of the fuel. So it's not uh, surprising that nobody wants to pay for it, and this is being proposed now as uh, uh, tax credits, right? Which means that the community has uh, to pay for it. And so there is a question, can we do more? And it's difficult, because when you look at climate solutions, and people say, we need all, all of the above, like uh, CO2 capture, industrial decarbonization, hydrogen, the renewables, lightweighting, electrification. We saw you guys have power lines in the, in the conference scheme. All of these are connected and they're conflicted drivers. Let me give you a couple of examples. If you want to make clean hydrogen, you have two ways to do that. One is if you use steam methane reforming, then you have to capture the CO2 and store it somewhere. So if we Move to uh, if we move to making more hydrogen by steam methane reforming, we put more pressure on CO two capture. If we want to make uh, uh, hydrogen by um, water electrolysis with electricity, 
then we put a bigger burden on uh, renewables. And same thing for, for example, electrification. Electrification requires more copper, more aluminum, and for anything that is moving, it makes for heavier vehicles because of all this copper and aluminum for conductors as well as batteries. And so there is a contrast between electrification and lightweight. Now, these two together, uh, when you electrify and lightweight vehicles, you end up using materials that require much more energy to make and have much higher CO2 emissions. For example, aluminum is a much dirtier material uh, uh, to make compared to steel. It's lighter, but it's dirtier to make. And so you, if as you electrify and lightweight, uh, you put more pressure on industrial decarbonization. So it's a little bit like fighting a hydra, right? It's, uh, it's got all these heads and you try to cut off a head and another head comes up. And so what I will talk to you about today is the carbon shot which is a, a way to actually address uh, uh, all these issues by looking at uh, how we use carbon and change the way we use carbon. Stop using carbon as a fuel and start using carbon as a material. And if we do this correctly, we're going to restore the balance to the earth without uh, having to go through um, uh, cutting of our prosperity. Now. To understand this from a global point of view, uh, one needs to look at the fluxes of oil and gas, right? And, and I'm not going to talk about coal because I think coal just has to be left into the ground. There's nothing that we can do with coal. Just stop burning it, leave it where it is. But oil and gas is a little bit different. So oil and gas, uh, they actually can be extracted very efficiently, and there's very little uh, CO2 um, um, emissions uh, that come from extraction of oil and gas. The problem is on the use end, most of this oil and gas is used as fuel and we introduce oxygen and we make CO2. And keep in mind that about 70% of the mass of CO2, uh, carbon dioxide, is actually oxygen. Um, a small amount goes into polymers and lubricants. Now, can we steer more of this uh, oil and gas towards making materials, right? And uh, if we do that, we can realize that uh, most of oil and gas is carbon uh, in mass. But if you look at energy, the energy in the carbon, it's about the same as the energy on the hydrogen. So the question is the following. Can we use this carbon as material and can we use the hydrogen for energy? Because if we do this, half of this energy that we get from oil and gas now would still be available in terms of form of hydrogen energy. And then if we can find ways to use the carbon that make us more efficient, maybe we actually save energy, right? And so how could we do this? Well, um, the way we would have to do it is splitting hydrocarbons. So we have uh, carbon and hydrogen, and that's what constitutes hydrocarbon. This is the simplest hydrocarbon, it's methane. It's also the one that has the most hydrogen. Um, Technologically, the splitting of methane has been known for over 100 years. And uh, it can be done uh, with electricity and therefore without any CO2 emissions. And it requires energy input because uh, the energy of carbon plus uh, hydrogen is higher than the energy of methane. So we would need an energy input of about 18.8 uh, gigajoules per ton of hydrogen produced. But a ton of hydrogen has much higher energy uh, than uh, this ton uh, that uh, what is required to make. So there is a potential net energy output. Uh, of course, it depends on the efficiency. This is the minimum energy needed, and this is the actual energy of the hydrogen. In reality, this may be a higher number. But there is a big difference here. It's about a factor of seven higher. Uh, also, we wouldn't be making three tons of solid carbon. And... Uh, Hydrogen is a commodity. You can make it in different ways, but eventually it's always the same uh, um, gas. Uh, carbon is a specialty. When it becomes uh, this type of carbon, you can have anything from uh, essentially useless carbon and soot to carbon uh, uh, black, which is a very useful material, to other types of carbon. And uh, However, the current markets for carbon materials are limited. Uh, the biggest market is carbon black. That's what goes mostly in tires. And then there are some smaller markets uh, in the order of a million tons a year or 100,000 tons a year.
these are very small compared to the markets uh, uh, for oil and gas that we're in the order of about uh, 5.5 billion tons of mega gigatons of carbon. And why is that? Well, the reason is carbon black, uh, it's useful, but can only be used in limited application because it does not have structural integrity. Some of these other materials have structural integrity, like carbon fibers, but they're very expensive, require a lot of energy to make, and have a high CO2 footprint. And so, uh, are there ways to uh, make materials that are better than what we have now? And also, what kind of efficiency cost and policy would be required for these to work? If we look at how we make uh, materials, how much materials we use, um, we see that there's really a few areas. One is uh, natural materials, right? One is uh, ceramics, polymers, and metals. So the first thing is structural integrity is key for widespread use. Carbon black is much smaller than this other system, is a logarithmic scale, because it doesn't have structural integrity. Concrete and cement, for example, when they're mixed, uh, they have structural integrity. We can make big objects out of this. And so do metals and... Uh, uh, this is wood for constructions, etc. Now, uh, we don't want this to displace uh, natural materials because these actually are already sinks of carbon, right? If we make a building out of wood, then uh, the carbon dioxide that was uh, captured by the tree to make uh, uh, the, uh, the wood is now immobilized for the lifetime of the building. Uh, now, these materials are, are very large amounts, but they have low value about five US cents per kilogram, and they're used only in static structures. So these are difficult to displace. But over here, there's metals. These are much more expensive materials. At the low end, the steel is about 80 cents a kilo. At the high end, the steel is more like six, seven dollars a kilo. Copper starts at a seven, eight dollars a kilo. And all these materials are used in transportation, which means the fact that they're heavy is a penalty for them. The other thing is that these are the big offenders for industrial emissions. Aluminum and steel alone are the majority of industrial emissions. Uh, once you put copper and cement, uh, you get to uh, about 15% of the total CO2 emissions. So if we could use carbon to displace these materials, uh, we would actually have uh, a reduction in emissions also on the use side. Another thing is that right now we have what a colleague of mine says, we have a, a carbon dioxide tunnel vision. So we only think about carbon dioxide. But this is actually an aerial shot of uh, bauxite mining and deforestation. And it's, uh, it's uh, in the Amazon in Brazil. And I didn't put it there because uh, the talk uh, is to a Brazilian audience, but I've been using this uh, picture uh, to show that there are other impacts. Uh, this is not a legal operation, of course, um, but uh, you see here that there is uh, a river has been dammed to make hydroelectric power, clear cut in a forest uh, to extract uh, bauxite and then convert it into aluminum. So there are a lot of other uh, environmental impacts in uh, um, mining. For example, this is for copper mining. This is now uh, in Chile. The largest copper mine in the world is called uh, Mina Escondida, which means a hidden mine. It's in Chile. It's in the desert of Chile. It's on indigenous land. And it makes about 1.1 million tons a year of uh, copper. This is how big the site is. So this is 10 miles or 15, 16 kilometers for uh, comparison. Now, to the right, uh, we have uh, an oil platform in the Gulf of Mexico. It's uh, um, the Perdido oil platform. And uh, uh, they, they give you the, you know, the production using hundreds of thousands of barrels a day and in cubic feet. But if you put it into mass metric uh, um, uh, units, uh, this is about uh, uh, five and a half million tons a year of carbon and a million ton a year of hydrogen, roughly. And uh, uh, so this uh, uh, extractive uh, uh, operation is much more productive than the copper mine, but it's also much smaller. And the reason it's much smaller is copper is currently mined at 0.3% of concentration. So you need to move a ton of ore to get three kilos of copper. It's a very inefficient uh, um, uh, operation. 
Perdido is about 50 meters by 50 meters in size. So it's a very, very small operation. Now, if you look at it again globally, uh, copper, aluminum, and steel, the total uh, footprint of these uh, materials, it's about 12% of the energy used in the world, and it's about 15-16% uh, uh, of the emissions. So when people like Bill Gates say, what's your plan for steel? We say that plan for steel is we're going to replace it. And we're going to replace it by using carbon. Uh, we're going to lower the energy use and eliminate the CO2 emissions. So we have hydrogen production on one side and carbon displacing materials that are inherently dirty, that require a lot of energy for their manufacturing, and they cause a lot of emissions. Now, is this science fiction? Um, it is not. The uh, um, technology now exists to go from uh, hydrocarbons to a type of carbon, which is carbon nanotubes primarily, and perhaps graphene, that has structural properties. It's already possible, the uh, scalable processing, to uh, make this material into usable shapes, fibers, tapes, fabrics, etc. And these are properties that have been demonstrated now to be um, comparable to metals and structural materials. And so now the challenge is to go into large-scale volume applications and markets where these materials can be used at a million tons a year each, like electrical cables, overhead cables, and uh, uh, both uh, the electrical as well as the structural components of trucks, uh, uh, ships, uh, electrical motors, bridges, and eventually even houses. Um, so how does this uh, uh, work out? Well, carbon nanotubes were discovered in the early 90s. Uh, and uh, they're not really a material. It's a class of material. So there's many different types of carbon nanotubes. People say they may have one wall, may have multi-wall, but uh, um, uh, it's a little more complicated than that. But uh, the, in terms of uh, properties, it was recognized that the nanoscale level, the scale of one or a few nanotubes, the strength, electrical conductivity, and the thermal conductivity were extremely high, much higher than those of metals. And uh, however, around the year 2000, there were very few applications uh, available. So the material was available but it was very difficult to convert the material into structures. And so to the point that uh, Scientific America, for example, in 2000 said the idea that we we're going to make super strong materials with carbon nanotubes is science fiction. Now, things have changed a lot. This is uh, uh, what's happening now. Now, these are now small materials, uh, but they are now at small industrial scale. For example, Hansman and Dexman, Dexman is a company that I started, are now making fibers, um, yarns, films uh, at a scale of a uh, ton a year. And they're made out of nanotubes that now have been industrialized uh, on a total production of about 120 tons a year, last year, about two years ago. So, again, these are small numbers, but it's no longer a laboratory curiosity. And how has this come about? Well, first of all, properties had to become better. Uh, in 2000, this whole area was science fiction. Nobody could make materials out of carbon nanotubes. By 2004, the first uh, scientific publications came out showing that it was possible to make fibers out of carbon nanotubes. And the fibers got better and better. So this is strength versus year. And what you see is uh, roughly the strength doubled every three years by better properties, by better control on the material, better control on processing. The same thing is true for electrical conductivity. Um, it was right over marginal, and now it's getting to be within a factor of uh, uh, three of aluminum and about a factor of five of copper. So it's not the best, the best material ever, but it is definitely um, um, tracking uh, to get there. And the other thing that's very important is uh, the number of filaments that were made together to make fiber has been going up and up. And so now it's possible to make materials that are 
uh, specimens that are kilometers long, uh, millimeters in diameter, and it's also possible to uh, make uh, other structures like fabric. And I wish I could be there with you in Rio and show this uh, in person. Um, now, if you put this in what's called HP plots, where you take uh, two properties and you plot materials, what you see is these materials now are on the upper right side, which is uh, where you want to be in terms of properties, which means that for strength, they're comparable to carbon fibers, and these are some of our carbon nanotubes. For electrical conductivity, they are now comparable to metals. It's not the strongest material ever, it's not the most conductive, but they're comparable to both. And uh, the same is true for uh, thermal conductivity and young models. Again, uh, um, these properties are quite uh, um, attractive. Moreover, they have a lot of other interesting uh, uh, features, like their low density, um, their corrosion resistance, uh, they have high bending fatigue, etc., etc. So what has to happen now? Well, what has to happen is something similar for solar energy. If you look at solar energy, uh, solar power was already used uh, in the 1950s to power satellites, but it was very expensive, right? And in the 70s and the 80s, continues to be uh, very expensive. And at some point, uh, there had to be a, an effort uh, to push down the price uh, of uh, uh, solar power so that it would be comparable to, say, coal, uh, nuclear, and natural gas. And so now we need to do something very similar, which is uh, we need to push the cost of these materials, these new carbon nanotube uh, sustainable materials, to uh, levels that are comparable to carbon fibers, high-end steel, copper, aluminum, and uh, uh, low-end steel. So can we reduce this cost to in the order between 50 and 100 dollars a kilo by the end of this decade and, and scale up production by another two orders of magnitude? So uh, carbon nanotubes uh, can be made in many different ways. This has been known for over 20 years. Um, it's, um, one needs a carbon source, and hydrocarbons have been the preferred carbon source uh, since about 2005. A um, little bit of a catalyst, typically it's iron. There's different um, ways to make them um, in different type of reactors. But until about five, six years ago, uh, nobody paid any attention to efficiency. And the if understanding of reactors was extremely low. In 2018, we basically convinced uh, uh, Shell, the RPAE, which is part of the Department of Energy here, in the United States to focus a program to understand CNT reactors. And other participants have been, have been Hansman, Stanford, University of Cambridge, Polytechnic Milano, and others. And so the idea was to go directly from methane to carbon nanotube fibers and understand what would be the potential and how do you reduce costs. Um, progress has been massive. Um, the initial conversion, so how much methane was converted into valuable carbon, was less than 0.5% in 2019. Now it's about 30%. The selectivity of the reaction, which means how much of that carbon is the high-quality carbon made from fibers, is now above 90%. The amount of energy that is needed to make these materials is now below 200 megajoules per kilo, which means that now this is already better than carbon and aluminum. And it's clear that we could get another factor of 10 uh, uh, improvement if we could understand these processes better. The scale is small. This is now proven at about five kilos a year, but it's about a thousand X cost reduction. So now we're preparing for um, demo scale. Now, what's important is the material that comes out of this reactor, it has very high quality. It can be made into uh, fibers that have high strength, high electrical conductivity, and high thermal conductivity. And how do, is this done? Well, this is done by taking uh, the nanotubes and putting them into an acid where they form a homogeneous solution called a liquid crystal. And then from there, we can extrude them out of the spinneret uh, and we can make uh, fibers. So you see here, continuously, these materials coming out of an orifice. The acid is being removed and it makes a solid fiber. But it's also possible to make foams and 3D structures. 
and uh, to these structures like films, coatings, and tapes. Now, the process that was developed uh, to do this was very inefficient. He made good materials, but he was very slow. Um, it was making fibers at about a meter a minute, it was using low concentration on additives, and he was using organic like acetone that are expensive and have very high CO2 footprint. And there were questions about the end of life of the fibers. What happens after you're done using it? So now, a lot of this has been resolved. Um, we can spin significantly faster, uh, over 50 meters a minute. We don't have to use organics. We can use water to coagulate. And uh, we're already spinning at about 10% concentration. We also know now that these fibers are fully recyclable. And finally, we can get the same properties with the efficient process as we did with the less efficient process. So again, over the, cost, over the course of the last five years, the cost reduction has been about 500x, and the production is much simpler than making carbon fibers. So uh, it, we could use existing industrial platforms to scale up. So this is exciting. It's not done, but it's on a good step. There's another part that's interesting. I'm going to switch now. What happens when you introduce a new material? That's a Ponte Ottiverio in Rimini, in Italy. So it was built by the Romans over 2,000 years ago. And it's an arch bridge. And the reason why it's done with arches is uh, so that all the materials is in compression. And that's because stone was a building material, and stone has a very high compressive strength uh, compared to its density. Now, suppose that, that we now have steel. Now, we know that the steel is a much better material for building bridges. But if we had gone to a Roman bridge engineer 2,000 years ago and we said, here is, here is some steel, why don't you build your bridge with steel? The Roman engineer would have said, first of all, this material is worse because it has lower compressive strength and it's much heavier. Right? So by this metric, stone is much better than steel. The second thing is to make the bridge... Um, the bridge engineer had stone cutters that were cutting the stones on site. You cannot do that with steel. And so uh, how uh, would you do that? And of course, so now we know the answer, you need to go to a different uh, bridge design, a suspended bridge. And so when you design a bridge as a suspended bridge, of course, uh, a lot of the structure is now in tension, and therefore you have uh, uh, this uh, uh, great advantage of steel that has a much higher tensile strength uh, divided by density. So what's important to understand is that when you build a new uh, material, you also have uh, to redesign application. You cannot just use the same uh, architecture of application as before. And so I think I hopefully uh, convinced you that uh, the climate and economic impact, uh, if this uh, um, technology go to scale can be massive. Uh, the material can even be CO2 negative. If we make it from renewable natural gas that comes from essentially biological degradation of biomass uh, that have been uh, fixed uh, via photosynthesis, the material could actually capture and uh, store uh, four kilograms of CO2 per kilo of carbon additive fibers. We would eliminate energy costs uh, and CO2 emissions of producing industrial metals. Um, we, we co-produce over 300 tons, million tons a year of hydrogen. That's about four times more hydrogen than we're producing now. Also for countries like the United States and Brazil, this is very important. We could continue to use uh, um, fossil hydrocarbons. We would stop burning and we would use them as feedstock to make materials, which means that jobs and economic prosperity would continue and then these materials will have additional impact in light weighting, providing materials for electrification, uh, have circularities, and build second generation renewables that have actually that are, are recycled. For example, wind turbines. Right now, the materials for wind turbines are not recyclable. If we build them with these carbon materials, we'll be uh, having um, recyclability. And so, to sum up, uh, we decide how do we do this? Okay, how do we go from a concept that has some merit to something that is going to work? And so we started an institute called the Carbon Hub, and that's here at Rice. Uh, it's housed by Rice, I should say, and it's a little bit of a hybrid of three things. One is an industrial consortium that directs and funds research in high impact areas. 
One is an institute that accelerates the emergency of an industry and large market space of carbon. And one is an accelerator for uh, startups, companies, demo projects in key technology areas. And so we're trying to organize this so we can engage corporations, uh, uh, federal agency, other universities, and other uh, collaborations. Um, it's essentially built to recreate a supply chain in a non-profit, pre-competitive uh, way, starting from hydrocarbons, that could be fossil or biological, all the way through uh, particular carbon and shapes, uh, and then uh, semi-finished goods, devices, and users. Um, right now, we're funded by um, uh, seven corporations, and Rice has been providing some funding too. Shell and Saudi Aramco are the largest uh, funders, uh, but uh, uh, we have a number of other uh, companies. And uh, research is not only a Rice, but we have research uh, in other uh, US uh, institutions as well, uh, at University of Cambridge, uh, uh, India, in Madrid, Politecnico di Milano, etc. And so uh, if you're excited about this, uh, I, I hope you'll consider um, joining us and uh, whether you're a corporation or a university. Um, thank you for your attention.